Yeah, we are starting a brand new lecture. You have everything you are going to get for cellular anatomy and physiology, and we are now moving on to the topic of genetics. So does anyone happen to know what genetics deals with? <laughs> if, you're, if you're really lucky, I'll tell you my genetics joke a little later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, someone that told me that Obama's going to require us to get our gene, whatever, what is it called, yeah. sequence, so that we can better our health or something? There, is this true? Sort of. You don't quite have all the facts quite right, but... During the State of the Union address this year, he proposed a new project called, and it's basically, it's going to cost like $235 million or billion dollars or something like that, and they're going to sequence a million individual genomes. And the point is to get a purpose, personalized medicine program up and running in the United States. Um, so basically, trying to look at large numbers of people from a bun bunch of different types of populations sequence their DNA and then if you fall in this category maybe you're you know a lanky Norwegian heritage Minnesotan who teaches you in Georgia and now you can get your medicine personalized so if I ever get cancer instead of treating me with I don't know doxorubicin will give me some other chemotherapeutic because it would work with my genetics better have you ever seen the, uh, there's a Nova special, it's called Cracking Your Genetic Information, or Cracking Your DNA, or something like that. It goes through, basically, it's really weird, that it, it goes through and it talks about the, the, the horizon that we've arrived at in, genetic, in genetics and in molecular biology, and really the consequences of where we are, and thinking ahead about... <laughs> the reality of, of, of what we're what we're stepping into. You know, we have politicians here in the United States that we could go and maybe we see them at a restaurant and they they're eating them with a fork or something. We can go and we can snatch that fork and we can send it off to the lab and we can get all their genetic information. Imagine the power you would have. Especially if you found out that that politician had this splice variant for Alzheimer's. I mean you could you could run elections that way. Um, but then there's the other side where, yeah, personalizing your medicine to fit your genome is actually a good thing. We can type match, not just based off of blood types and tissue types, but type match tissue specifically to your genetic information so that they have a much lower probability of rejection of transplanted organs. There's a lot of really good stuff, um, but a lot of really, really bad stuff. The ironic thing about it is, have any of you ever seen the movie Gattaca? It's spelled G-A-T-T-A-C, and if you're astute, you'll recognize that that's the four bases of DNA. So this movie, Gattaca, which was written in the 90s, it was like Ethan Hawke, when he was like 20 years old, was, was one, of, one of the actors in there. And it basically painted this picture of personalizing, um, just making designer babies, and, and like all this stuff that, that we weren't able to do at the time with our genetic information, and now 20 years later, we're actually beyond that now. Just in 20 years, we've gone from what no one ever expected to be reality to going beyond what was reality, and it's kind of kind of weird. Cray. Great. Cray. 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 <laughs> Cray totes my goats. <laughs> Do you think that like just made sense? Like that was. Totally crazy, my goats. <laughs> Before all that, the, the Gattaca thing, I, I never noticed, because I, I know about that movie, and I, I didn't notice that was like the G-A-T-T-A. See, I think that's pretty clever. In there. Or, yeah, but not very clever that you didn't figure it out until I told you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. The number of times that I've... That I've ripped on you. You really, you really have so much against me, and it's alright. Really, I just. I mean, <laughs> all right, maybe. <laughs> so genetics. Genetics deals with this molecule right here. This is DNA. So genetics is really the study of deoxyribonucleic acid. D 
DNA. Now, what exactly is DNA? DNA is actually a thread-like molecule that is big but very thin. Okay, so it's actually going to be on the order of about four centimeters in length, but about two nanometers in thickness. So four centimeters in length, which is actually pretty perceptible to the human eye, but two nanometers, which is infinitesimally small. So it's a big but thin molecule, four centimeters long, two nanometers thick. And from a chemical perspective, we consider this to be a nucleotide polymer. The nucleotide is just simply one of the types of macromolecules important for biology. Nucleotides, amino acids, carbohydrates, and lipids. And it's going to be a polymer. And a polymer just simply means that we have many nucleotides that are all bound up together. Okay, so. Uh, um, a monomer would be the individual nucleotide, like adenosine or um, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. Okay, so it's a nucleotide polymer. The nucleotides that we find in DNA are cytosine, which in biology shorthand is simply going to be C. We also have thymine, which is T. Now, both of these molecules, they are going to have just a single nitrogen carbon ring. So the chemical structure is just to be that single nitrogen carbon ring. We call these single nitrogen carbon ring containing nucleotides pyrimidines. So pyrimidines. So you can actually see our pyrimidines of C and T here on the far left-hand side of the figure. We also have adenine and guanine. Adenine is going to be A and guanine is going to be G. Now these are actually going to be slightly different. They're going to actually be a double nitrogen carbon ring. This makes them a purine. Okay, so we have pyrimidines, which are a single ring, and the purines, which are double rings. The DNA's structure. Anyone happen to know who discovered DNA's structure? Watson and Crick. You've been paying attention. Okay, so James Watson and Francis Crick, and actually in all reality a bunch of other people as well, Maurice Wilkins, uh, Rosalind Franklin, um, Oswald Avery, there's a whole story behind the discovery of DNA. Watson and Crick just happened to write the paper. And it was actually a very insignificant paper. It was only really about one page long, uh, but it was a monumental discovery, especially in the context of genetics day with human genome sequencing and uh, things like that. So the DNA structure was discovered by Watson and Crick. Who discovered DNA? <coughs> Uh, we were just getting free Friedrich Meisch. So Watson and Crick, a lot of times if you just pull just the everyday American, they'll be like, oh yeah, Watson and Crick discovered DNA. But they really did. They elucidated DNA structure. That was in the 1940s and 1950s. DNA was actually discovered in the 1860s by a guy by the name of Friedrich Meisch. And at the time, he knew that there was a um, phosphate-containing, nit nitrogen-containing substance that can be extracted from uh, pus cells, from basically white blood cells, from wounds. Uh, and he just called it nuclein. Little did he know that it was going to become DNA, which became um, 
the foundation for life, the language of God, a, a, a variety of other nicknames for, for this molecule. So Watson and Crick discovered DNA structure, and the, the structure that they discovered has become known as the double helix. And you can actually see the double helix. It looks like a winding staircase. You have um, these twists that occur, and there's actually going to be um, many, many twists that occur throughout the length of a, uh, of a double helix. The only way that this structure actually can be achieved is if we take our nucleotide bases, our A, G, C, and T, and we align pyrimidines and purines. So pyrimidines pair with purines. Now when you look at this, pyrimidines, how many carbon rings do we have in a pyrimidine? How many do we have in a purine? And so we're always going to have three rings across the structure, across our DNA molecule. One, two, three. One, two, three. Okay. Now, a step further here, not only was it a pyrimidine pairing with a purine, but we now understand that there is a very specific way in which these molecules pair. We call this the law of complementary base pairing. Okay, the law of complementary base pairs or base pairing. So not only is it a purine with a pyrimidine, but it's specifically going to be A bound to T. And the two lines here is not an equal sign. This is actually the hydrogen bond. We're going to have two hydrogen bonds across that base pair. <laughs> the base pair between guanine and cytosine is going to have three hydrogen bonds, as you can see represented here. So because of the law of complementary base pairing, A's only bind to T's, T's only binds to A's, G's to C's, and C's to G's. So if I give you one sequence, you can determine the complementary sequence. So A, G, C, T, A, A, G, T, T, you should be able to tell me what is the sequence of the paired DNA strand? Okay, so we start out with T, C, G, A, T, T, C, A, A. All right, so you need to know one and you can derive the other. You think the sequel will be... <laughs> 20 years after Gattaca. <laughs> and our DNA is so scrambled that we're all a bunch of retards. <laughs> That was probably really inappropriate. <laughs> Sorry. Are you recording? <laughs> Since everyone's here, this might not go up tonight. <laughs> All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about DNA anatomy. Another way to put this is we're going to look at the levels of structure. And really what it comes down to is we have the cell and the nucleus, and the nucleus is where the DNA is going to reside. And this is really, really small. 
So how do we pack all of this information in the human genome? It's 3.5 billion individual nucleotides. How do we pack that amount of information in that small of an area, that small of a volume uh, inside of the nucleus? And we're going to structure it. We're going to take these different levels of structure and we're going to compact the DNA down. Now, I'm hoping that I'm going to actually kind of revolutionize your thinking on DNA. Some of you have already kind of experienced some of this material before, so send a couple text messages or something. For the others, you probably have a view of DNA that is very erroneous. DNA is uh, affiliated with the chromosome inside of a cell. Now, the chromosome itself has a variety of different structures and shapes that it can take on. A lot of you, if I were to say, hey, come up here and draw a DNA molecule, a lot of you might draw something that looks something like that, or maybe something that looks something like that. And that's actually accurate, but inaccurate at the same time. DNA only takes on this form of chromosome, or the chromosome, I should say, takes on this form only a very small part of the life of the cell. The majority of the time, it's in a more filamentous, thread-like structure. And we're going to talk about all of that in just a second here. Uh, so we have this molecule or this structure of the chromosome called the chromatin. And the chromatin is going to be a filamentous material. And this filamentous material, I actually have a picture here of sort of what this looks like. It's going to take the chromosome and it's going to diffuse it out and make it much more thread-like, not packed up into this X-shaped structure. The chromatin, again, this is a uh, type of chromosome or a state of the chromosome, is going to consist of the DNA molecule and proteins. So the structure or this molecule that we refer to as the chromosome is actually not just DNA, it's also going to be proteins. Proteins are going to be present as well. Now the chromatin, the structure of the chromosome known as the chromatin is our most common condition. Inside of a human cell that we find in the body, or what we would say outside of the germline, which by the way, the germline is the fancy way of saying the, the tissue we find inside of the tes testicles and the ovaries where the sex, uh, sex cells are being produced. Everything else is a body cell, what we refer to as a somatic cell. So inside of human somatic cells, we would find 46 filaments for our 46 individual chromosomes. So these are 46 individual molecules. It's not like one big long molecule that has 46 regions. You can pull out chromosome number one. It would be this long filamentous structure called chromatin. We can put it aside and we can pull out a second molecule of, uh, or chromosome of, um, of DNA. 46 is uniquely human, 23 pairs if you do the math there. A pair, uh, in, the, in the pairs you have one set that's from mom and one set that's from your dad. Uh, 46 again is very human. Cats are 72, mice are 20. Um, strawberries are actually um, not just a pair, one from mom, one from dad. They actually have eight copies. They're called octoploid because they have eight copies of each of their chromosomes. And I think they have um, 40 chromosomes. I don't remember if that's exactly right, so don't quote me. But uh, a large variety of different types of uh, and numbers of chromosomes. And more doesn't necessarily mean more complex. Humans at 46, I would argue, are the most complex organisms on the planet because we've developed a very complex language. We have very complex, complex social society or social um, structures and, and cultural things and things like that. 
cats are much less uh, sophisticated and have more genetic material. Yes. Is filament just a synonym for chromatin? No, filament is like a like monofilament line on a fishing reel. Okay. That's a filament. Uh, like what happens like in your body whenever you have more from or filaments? Because like in in Mary Beth Johnson. Yeah, they doubled they doubled the, the chromosomes and that was um, fatal. Um, so let me go back here real quick. Filaments is just referring to, I'm just using that as a, a filament is like a long thread-like structure. Like think about the, the it's, it's a term that I'm using to, to describe what it would look like. A monofilament fishing line, you can think of what that's like. It's going to look very similar to the monofilament fishing line. But it gets all kind of clumped up into this diffuse structure called the chromatin. So you can actually see that filament here, but then the whole thing, the whole chromosome is going to be chromatin. Okay, so Macy was asking about what about extra genetic material? Not only can we have extra genetic material, we can actually have less genetic material as well. Um, some of these extra chromosomes or loss of chromosomes are going to be fatal. So in the case of um, their baby, it was every single chromosome, all 46 of the chromosome were duplicated, so there's 92 chromosomes inside of the cell, and it was not viable. Whenever I give talks on abortion or anything like that, I always define human, uh, the human genome as being 46 plus or minus 1. And the reason I do that is because there are some instances, instances where we have an extra chromosome, such as trisomy 22, or 21, which is Down syndrome. There's actually other trisomies where uh, like chromosome 13 can be duplicated, and that's another type of condition. Uh, we can also actually lose chromosomes as well, and it still can be viable. Yes, there's going to be some um, consequences, uh, severe mental retardations, um, the physical uh, incapabilities and things like that, but these are still humans, right, by definition. It's not like, oh, you have an extra chromosome, you have 47 chromosomes, so you're not really human. You still fall into that category of being human. Um, so, yeah, we can have extra chromosomes or one, few chrom uh, one less chromosome. It's usually going to be pathophysiological in nature. It's not going to be normal normal physiology, but some of them are survivable, some of them are not. What usually happens, and there's a variety of different um, speculations out there on how it happens, you have some sort of abnormal division during mitosis and abnormal replication of the molecule. So you basically have a copy that gets produced when a copy shouldn't have been produced to get the extra. Or you have no copy being produced when a copy should have been produced and you lose one. And it's just basically, that's so that would be happening in mom and dad, right? Mom and dad cells go undergo really meiosis to produce their, their sperm cell and their egg cell, and you have something go wrong erroneously, and so you only end up with 22 chromosomes in the egg or 22 chromosomes in the sperm or 24 in the egg or 24 in the sperm. And then that combines with a normal sperm or egg from mom or dad. And now instead of 46 chromosomes, you have 20, uh, 47 or 45. What happens when you have extra? Well, down, you've, you've probably um, interacted with Down syndrome right. babies before. That, do they have less? Or they have an extra. They're, it's called a trisomy, which means instead of being a pair of chromosome uh, 21 and 22, there's three of them. There's three of those chromosomes. So like when you have less? When you have less, they, um, uh, I guess I don't really know what they would call less. I've never. My cousin, like, he, he's, like, mentally, like, he's, like, a kid, but he was, like, completely normal. But you, but he can't talk. Or, like, he's, like, a child. Like, a child. Okay. But he, like, it's just, like, I don't know. We don't, I, no one knows like what is really wrong. He's not really, he's kind of like down to them because he was completely normal, but he's like 30. Okay. So it may not even be an extra chromosome. Yeah, I don't know, like if it was like he had less or 
doesn't have one. See, the thing is, is there's that's a possibility, but there's so many other genetic diseases. There's yeah. this genetic disease, and they actually test babies for it when they're born. They look to see how uh, your phenylalanine metabolism is going to be. And if you don't have the specific enzyme or you have the wrong version of this enzyme, which they can detect from just a little blood sample or a little uh, foot prick, um, you end up getting phenylalanine built up in the brain. And it, it, the, the, the child would otherwise norm, develop normally. In fact, if they have the enzyme that's defective, they get medicine and they're totally normal. But they don't get that medicine. They have phenylalanine that builds up in their brain, and starts to, to, to cause some severe problems in the with with uh, mental development, and yeah, that can be an issue. Or high bilirubin levels. Which how many babies have had? I mean, almost every baby that comes out of the hospital has had has high bilirubin. If it gets too high, it starts to pigment the brain, and you have other issues that uh, that arise with mental development there as well. Right now, from what I understand, there are about 6,000 genetic diseases. Diseases that are based off of some sort of deviation from normal. A lot of them can actually now be managed very, very well. And actually, so you're going to get me off here just a little bit. Adam and Eve probably genetically perfect, right? So then you have the fall in the Garden of Eden. And for the last six or eight thousand or fifty thousand years, but just short period of time, right? Since the Garden of Eden to present day, we've accumulated a lot of this junk, the effect of, of of the sin and the fall, of sin and the fall, right? Um, and so now we're basically left over with dealing with all of this stuff. There was at one time a perfect genetic code. And if we could go back to that perfect genetic code, we would have the genomes that God had originally intended. It's impossible to do that, though. The only way to break this cycle is through a personal relationship with Christ. It's the only way. But there are ways in which we can actually manage these diseases so that we don't have people who are losing their life at five years of age. They can prolong their life in the 80s. Uh, and so we, we discovered a lot of things. One of the things that excites me the most, and I know this is going to sound crazy because it's been the, the topic of several movies. One of them was I Am Legend, dealt with this. Why does a virus exist? Have you ever thought about that question? Vi if, we, if we believe that God created everything at the beginning of time, at the beginning of our recollection, recollection of time, he created viruses. But if he created everything and it was good and perfect from the beginning, then the virus that really is only making us sick today deviates significantly from what it says in the Bible. So why does a virus exist? Why do we get influenza? Why do we get uh, the rhinovirus and colds and things like that? Why is AIDS and HIV so prominent around, around the world? Why do viruses exist? And I actually think that we are now understanding why viruses exist. Viruses can be programmed or engineered to carry very specific molecules of DNA. And one of the things that's being attempted now is to use a viral vector, basically the virus, and we take out its original DNA or RNA genome and we put in an engineered genome. And we engineer that genome so it carries a specific cancer drug. And then that specific cancer drug, in the, in the context of that virus, you put the virus into the bloodstream, and it targets specifically where we need it to go. So there are, there are viruses that specifically go to the pancreas. It causes problems in the pancreas. So what if we can deliver a pancreatic <coughs> drug using the, the individual's uh, ability to produce new proteins? We give them a virus that contains DNA that has the medicine in it for pancreatic. So instead of giving them just a general dose of a cancer drug, which most cancer drugs are really, really bad, um, one, of the, one of the ones I know the most about is doxorubicin. Doxorubicin uh, is a, uh, it's an antibiotic, basically, that has anti-tumor properties. You give doxorubicin, it's an excellent chemotherapeutic. 
but it causes you to have heart disease. So trade off your cancer that's going to kill you for heart disease that's going to kill you a little while later. And the big reason is, is because we're trying to, you know, you may use doxorubicin for a, a, a glioblastoma or something like that, a brain cancer, but where do you get it? You get it so it goes everywhere, and so it also attacks the heart. What if we can create doxorubicin inside of a virus, and we can put it into the bloodstream, and it targets those fast-growing cells in the brain and doesn't even touch your heart? So that's why I think viruses actually exist. It is because of those 6,000 those 6, diseases that have developed over the last 6,000 years as we move further and further away from that original God-intended genetic material. I think that when I observe that and when I think about that, that I serve an incredible God that not only is worried about my salvation, but 6,000 years ago had already planned for my, my health 6,000 years later. Incredible. I was going to say, um, you know, my son has, has a genetic disorder, and this was eight years ago. And then we had a geneticist. You know, my husband and I had no clue what was going on with him. You know, they did tell us to abort him because they didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And then he was born. I mean, yeah, he had some problems, but it, like you said, I mean, this was eight years ago. What they could do now with him, and I mean, he's fine. You know, he's got the genetic disorder. We've dealt with the stuff that's gone with it. He gets some surgeries every once in a while. And yeah, he's good. Yeah. He's good. So, I mean, Tom is, Tom is huge. I mean, everything is not about, you know, ever gone over. Yeah. The, the thing that's crazy, and, and this is, uh, again, I'm, I'm deviating here a little bit. Um, you, you have a company that's taken DI on one set. Any of you remember how many how many peer-reviewed articles we add to the biology literature every year in biology? Is it over a thousand, right? No, it's like 10,000. Well, a little bit. A half a million new articles are added to the biology <coughs> literature every 365 days. It's like 4,000 new pieces of information a day. And it's actually... To be perfectly honest, I think we've actually slowed down. I think a thousand or a hundred years ago, we actually were making bigger leaps in discoveries than we are today. But we're still putting in massive amounts of information from all around the world, understanding biology each day more and more and more with these little pieces of information that get added. And that's no wonder. I mean, do you, how many? Okay, you all were probably alive in between 1998 and 2000. You probably don't remember. There is a, um, there was a press conference that was held, and I remember it really vividly. It was Bill Clinton, who was president at the time, standing next to Francis Collins, who's now the director of the National Institutes of Health. And it was right after they had finished sequencing the first human genome. And I remember Bill Clinton says, we have discovered the language of God. And that's like about all I really remember from. That was in, I think it was 1999 that that pre press conference had occurred. So that's not, that's 16 years ago. That was the first human genome. 16 years later, we've sequenced thousands of other species of animals. We've sequenced thousands of other humans. And we know more about our genetic information in these last 16 years than the previous 100 years, just in 16 years in genetics alone. Just massive amounts of information. Is there such thing as a cure for cancer? I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the case. But we're getting, an awful, we're getting awful good at, at treating a lot of different types of cancer. The, the uh, expected death rate from, from Breast cancers used to be really high. It's now less less than 5% of all cases end in death. Most of them are treated. Still got a lot of work to do, but we're making progress. Okay, so um, 46 individual filaments or 46 individual chromosomes in that filamentous structure. That's what we would find in the human 
somatic cell. Now we have to pack all of this stuff in to a very small area inside of the nucleus. Human genome, 3.5 billion nucleotides into a space that's infinitesimally small. In computer technology, we haven't figured out how to get that kind of information on a hard disk in that sort of, um, of that amount of, of information on that small of a space. I mean, you can get a hard drive now that's about that big, just a little bit bigger than a pack of cards that has terabits, terabytes of information on it, which is, you know, it's a kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte. <laughs> so a lot of information, but that's still gigantic. That's like thousands of cells in size. And we're packing even more information into the nucleus of the cell. Biologically, the way that we handle it is we organize the DNA in the chromosome in such a way that it allows and facilitates um, this packing. And so this is really the levels of structure to take this, these 46, four centimeter long molecules, two nanometers in width, and condense them down to be able to put them inside of the nucleus, okay? There are, there are a couple different levels of chromatin packing. So this is our chromatin, that diffuse filamentous structure, and we're going to take the DNA and we're going to organize it in such a way that we can get those fibers to wrap them up and place them inside of the nucleus. We're going to start out at the very first level of compaction. I'm going to just simply call this level one compaction. And this is centered around a group of proteins known as the histones. These are, the histones are an eight protein complex. And they form these little bead-like structures that you can see here. And what we do is take these eight proteins and we're able to structurally support the chromosome and the DNA, and really it's the DNA, and reduce its overall size. So we're going to structurally support and reduce the size. And the way that we're going to do this is that eight protein complex, and I'll just sort of draw out a little picture of one here. So those eight proteins kind of in a overall sphere shape, if you will. The DNA is going to wrap around those histones, so wraps the histones about one and a half times. Okay, so the DNA comes in and it wraps about one and a half times around, so one and a half around the histone. And then you have kind of this little linker DNA on one side, this little linker that goes now to another histone to wrap around that histone one and a half more times. So this really takes on an appearance that looks like a string of beads. And in fact, it has been referred to as a string of beads in, um, in, in the literature before. The anatomy here, so let me just kind of redraw it. We're going to have the linker and then the DNA wraps around it. So this is very ultra structure kind of uh, detail anatomy here. And we're talking and really the, the, the greatest magnification of electron microscopes, this is hard to see. The whole structure is going to be called a nucleosome. Okay, so you have individual nucleosomes here, the histone proteins and the associated DNA with that linker, this little piece of DNA here that goes to the next nucleosome. So that's going to be called a nucleosome. It's a division of the chromosome based off of the histone, and it's, compar or it's comprised of a core particle, which is going to just simply be the, new, the uh, histone and the one and a half turns of DNA, and then also 
the linker, that filament of DNA that runs to the next nucleosome. Paige, you got a question? Um, so the nucleosome is the whole thing. Yeah, the nucleosome would basically be from here over to here and includes that histone. Okay. Core particle, just the histone with the wrapped DNA, and then that's your linker. So the nucleosome consists of the core particle and that linker. So already you can see that I'm going to take and I'm going to reduce the DNA down in length because I'm wrapping it around the histone. The next is going to be zigzag. This is going to be level two compaction, and we're going to take that nucleosome, all of these individual nucleosomes, and we're going to begin to zigzag these nucleosomes. And so now I'm taking what would be a long filament, let's do it this way, this long filament, and I'm zigzagging it and compacting it down. So this zigzag is going to be that accordion structure. And it's going to give further compaction. And so that's what you really can see going on here. Here's that kind of zigzagging pattern. And now I'm going to begin to put in sort of these irregular loops, which is going to be our next level of compaction. Level three compaction is irregular loops. Did I say accordion structure? Yeah, accordion structure. That's probably not right, is it? <laughs> no, accordion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to ask if it's an accordion structure. Like, yeah, accordion. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It, the, the musical instrument, I'm not even sure if that's how that's spelled either. Probably I am. I O N. I O N. Accordion. <laughs> accordion. Oh, accordion. It's okay, you got a music No. Mom, I played the screen. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these irregular loops are level compaction number three. So once we get down to these irregular loops, which you can see kind of in this picture here, we actually have compacted enough that we can fit these long end-to-end -end chromosomes down into very, very small space of the nucleus. Okay? Now how, or, or actually I should say, where do they end up? Where does an individual chromosome end up inside of the nucleus? Is it just random where they are? Of course it's not random. It's actually going to be found in a chromosome territory. Okay, so the chromosome's territory. And a chromosome territory, we're going to have one filament consuming one region in the nucleus. So one filament contains or is compartmentalized into one region in the nucleus. So over here in this picture here, you might have nucleus 22, I'm sorry, not nucleus, chromosome 22 all uh, contained within this space. And then over here, oh, here's chromosome 1. And then over here is chromosome 15 and so on and so forth. Oh, this is actually um, an ex extension of the levels of compaction. We got it all compacted down. Now where is it going to go? And it's going to get shoved into this thing called the chromosome territory. This is basically just one chromosome in one defined region in the nucleus. Now, we also need to have channels that are going to be present. And that's what you see represented here kind of in these white spaces. These are channels that allow access for non-DNA molecules non-DNA molecules to interact with the chromosome.
So channels act to allow other molecules to interact. Now, last thing here on channel or on I'm sorry, territories, they actually are malleable, meaning they can change. And the territories change in response to a metabolic need or to metabolic needs. So if we need a certain protein, which would be a metabolic need, we may change the chromosome territory to add channel so that we can have molecules like RNA polymerase that can interact with the DNA to begin to produce the information that's required to generate that protein. What, what does that have to change? 